In mechanical engineering, few concepts appear more straightforward on the surface, yet are more misunderstood in practice than tolerances. In school, we're taught how to dimension parts on drawings and CAD, and barely any emphasis is placed on tolerances. In industry, tolerances affect just about everything you can think of, from manufacturing costs, inspection times, and scrap rates, to product performance, and even customer satisfaction. Over a span of four years, I've developed products from iPhones to automatic flush valves, soap dispensers, and hand dryers where space is very tightly constrained and tolerances tend to make or break designs. So in this video, we'll break down the fundamentals of tolerances, clear up any common misconceptions, and illustrate how tolerances can improve our designs and effectiveness as mechanical engineers. We'll cover traditional dimensional tolerances, how to strategically assess assign them, and how geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, or GD&T, provides a better, more realistic framework for defining part requirements. There's also a game-changing tool, Jiga.io, that has totally changed the way I design and make parts that I'm excited to share with you. So let's get started. Let's begin with the basics. No part is ever manufactured to its nominal size. There will always be some deviation, and tolerances define how much variation is acceptable without affecting the function of the part. For example, if you have a shaft with a diameter of 50 millimeters, it might be acceptable for it to be between 49.95 millimeters and 50.05 millimeters. That plus minus 500 of a millimeter is your tolerance. Where most engineers go wrong is assuming tighter is better. They assume a tighter tolerance means higher quality and better performance, but there's a huge trade-off. Tighter tolerances require more precise machining, better tooling, slower feed rates, and more frequent inspection. That means higher costs, longer lead times, and increased difficulty in sourcing. Over-tolerancing is one of the most common causes of cost overruns and supplier complaints. So let's say we're designing a plastic housing that mates with the cover. If you assign a 500 millimeter tolerance to all the screw holes and snap fits, you're implying that extremely high accuracy is required. But plastic injection molding can't hold those tolerances reliably, especially for larger parts. The mold, the material shrink rate, and temperature all introduce variation. Ideally, these features should have a more relaxed tolerance of plus minus two tenths of a millimeter if possible. So how do you assign the right tolerance? Start by thinking functionally. What does the feature do? Is it aligning a shaft in a jet engine carrying 300 soles? Is it locating a connector in a smartphone? Or is it creating a seal in a medical device? Determine how much variation that function can tolerate and assign a tolerance accordingly. Collaborate with your manufacturing team or suppliers if needed. They can definitely give you insight into what can be held easily and what might require additional processing. Moving on, there are three main types of fits in mechanical design. Clearance, transition, and interference fit. In a clearance fit, there's always space between parts such as a shaft and a hole. A transition fit may result in either a small clearance or interference. For an interference fit, the parts are designed to press against each other and require force to assemble. Now, let's talk about dimensional tolerancing versus geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, or GDNT. In traditional dimensional tolerancing, you define the X and Y position of features with linear dimensions and assign tolerances like plus minus one tenth of a millimeter to them. This creates a square tolerance zone. For a hole, that means the center must fall within a square box that is 0.2 millimeters wide, but a square zone doesn't make sense for a round hole. The result is a tolerance that is both overly restrictive in some directions and too loose in others. GDNT actually solves this by allowing you to control tolerances in a way that reflects the intended function of the part or assembly, such as using a circular or cylindrical tolerance zone. Tolerances are applied to features like holes, surfaces, or edges rather than dimensions. Feature control frames are these compartmentalized boxes used to fully define a geometric characteristic. The first box includes one of the 14 geometric characteristic symbols such as position, flatness, and parallelism. These 14 characteristics can be split into five categories, form, orientation, location, profile, and runout. The second box contains the tolerance value, often with a symbol indicating the shape of the zone like diameter for true position of a circle. I like to think of the tolerance as a three-dimensional 
three-dimensional tolerance zone that surrounds the true position. The following compartments specify datum references listed in order of precedence. It's very important to define your datum reference frame carefully. It establishes the origin and orientation from which other features are controlled. Always include clear datum symbols on your drawing to align with the GD&T frames. Now, it's worth mentioning a modifier can be added behind a tolerance or datums. GD&T modifiers are symbols placed in a feature control frame to clarify how a tolerance is applied. The most common is maximum material condition or MMC. Under MMC, the tolerance applies when the feature contains the most material. For a hole, this is the smallest diameter. For a pen, it's the largest diameter. The great thing about MMC is it allows bonus positional tolerance as the feature departs from its MMC size, making parts easier to manufacture and inspect. Now, before we continue talking about GD&T modifiers, I want to emphasize here that no matter what it is you're designing, sourcing custom parts, whether for personal, school, or work-related projects, presents all kinds of challenges. Engineering projects often face very tight deadlines, and finding the right supplier or manufacturer who can make quality, affordable parts fast and provide timely feedback is nearly impossible. That's why I highly recommend you to check out Jiga.io, who is very kindly sponsoring this part of the video. Jiga is a unique custom parts manufacturing platform that connects you with a vast network of vetted suppliers, allowing you to directly communicate your requirements to them. This means you get parts faster, cheaper, and made exactly the way you want. With Jiga, you get to build relationship with suppliers, which not only makes the process more reliable, but also simplifies even the most intricate projects. Whether you need prototype or production parts, Jiga can do it all with its CNC machining, sheet metal, 3D printing, and plastic injection molding capabilities. Their platform is insanely user-friendly. All you need to do is upload your parts and Jiga will provide a quote within hours from multiple suppliers, allowing you to compare prices and lead times to get the best deal possible. What's even better is Jiga's service is fully transparent. You can directly communicate with the supplier for DFM feedback on Jiga's website and add notes to the 3D models to let them know your requirements. Recently, I needed a last minute custom part made for a personal project. I simply uploaded my CAD files to Jiga and literally within minutes, I got quotes from three different suppliers and received the parts in under a week. Jiga is also trusted by top tier companies like Google, NASA, and Flex, so you can be sure the quality and on-time delivery of your parts are guaranteed. So if you're looking to simplify and streamline your manufacturing and get parts much faster, definitely check out Jiga.io through the link in the description below. The second modifier we'll talk about is Least Material Condition or LMC. Under LMC, the tolerance applies when the feature contains the least material. LMC is useful for features where strength or clearance is a concern at minimum size. The third and last modifier we'll talk about is regardless of feature size or RFS. RFS is the default and applies if you don't include a modifier. This means the tolerance must be met regardless of the actual size of the feature. There's no bonus tolerance here and it's the strictest interpretation. So to give an example, suppose we have a metal bracket with a mounting hole, which is considered a feature of size. The whole diameter should be called out with the dimensional tolerance. In this case, it's a unilateral tolerance. This means the hole's diameter can range from 10 millimeters to 10.05 millimeters. The MMC for the hole is 10 millimeters because that's when the hole is the smallest and contains the most material. The position tolerance is called out in a feature control frame. The position of the hole center must fall within the tolerance zone of 0 0.20 millimeters when the hole is smallest or at MMC. But if the hole is made larger, say 10.03 millimeters, you gain bonus tolerance. The bonus tolerance is calculated as actual hole size minus MMC size, which equals 10.03 millimeters minus 10 millimeters. That's three hundredths of a millimeter, which gets added onto the true position tolerance of 0.20 millimeters. This eases manufacturing and inspection while still meeting functional fit requirements. The same can be applied to LMC, which is useful if you want to control, say, the position of a hole near an edge. Now, I won't be going into each and every geometric characteristic in this video. If you want to learn more, I highly recommend you to check out the website GDNT Basics that covers everything you would ever want to know 
know about GDNT with some great examples. I'll drop a link in the description below for you to check out. However, I do briefly want to cover true position because it's one of the most useful and complex out of all the GDNT symbols. Position may be applied to any feature of size like a hole, slot, boss, tab, or sphere and control the central elements of these features. For a hole, this would be a circular area around the nominal location where the feature must fall. The tolerance zone would be cylindrical and extend through the thickness of the part. The entire feature axis, midplane, or point would need to be located in this tolerance zone. GDNT gives manufacturers greater flexibility while maintaining function and as a result can reduce part cost. Remember GDNT is not meant to replace dimensional tolerancing but rather complement it and highlight which aspects of your design are the most critical. One common misconception is that GDNT is only for aerospace or high precision applications. That's just not true. In reality, GDNT can and should be used whenever the function of a part depends on geometry, especially in assemblies. However, whether you can use GDNT depends entirely on your organization. Sadly, not every company implements GDNT. Now, generally speaking, most drawings will have a general tolerance block that governs all unspecified dimensions. Then you only need to explicitly define tolerances for critical to function features where fit alignment or performance depend on tighter control. Another mistake that engineers make is ignoring tolerance stackups. Leveraging tolerance analysis tools in your CAD software or performing a worst case or root sum square analysis can help you predict stackup issues before they become expensive problems. Tolerances also influence inspection. If your part drawing includes hundreds of unwarranted height tolerances, the inspection process becomes way more complex, time consuming, and costly. One way to reduce cost and inspection burden is to define general tolerances for non-critical dimensions following ISO 2768 or a similar standard. Reserve tighter tolerances and GDNT callouts to features that are essential to performance and function. I've also seen many engineers fail to up update tolerances when the design changes. For instance, they might resize a feature in CAD but forget to update the associated tolerance or revise the drawing. This creates a mismatch between design intent and actual manufacturing expectations. Always validate your drawings against the latest CAD model and review tolerances after any design change. Now I wanna mention here that one thing I always do is test designs physically before they ever go into production. 3D printing is my go-to for catching design issues, checking assembly fit, and actually feeling how parts work in my hands. Lately, I've been using this printer, the FlashForge 85X, in my own workspace to make functional parts, prototypes, and proof of concepts. It can print a part in four colors and in a wide array of materials including PLA, ABS, ASA, even flexible materials and does it fast up to 600 millimeters per second with the precision to hit tight tolerances. That means I can check for fit and function before spending thousands of dollars on tooling. I'll often print a few variations of a part, measure and test them and instantly know if I need to tweak the CAD model. This quick feedback loop saves me from expensive mistakes later. Whether it's a side project or something headed for production, having a 3D printer closes the gap between theory and reality a lot faster. And just to be clear, this isn't sponsored. A 3D printer is an essential tool that every engineer should have to streamline the design and product development process. I'll drop a link for the 85X in the description below for any of you who are interested. Now let's briefly go over decimal precision. Many engineers confuse the number of decimal places with accuracy. A dimension with one decimal place like 10.0 millimeter generally implies a looser tolerance such as plus minus five tenth of a millimeter. Two decimal places like 10.00 millimeter suggest plus minus one tenth of a millimeter and three decimal places imply tighter control such as plus minus a hundredth of a millimeter. Never assume tolerances just by the number of decimal places and always specify them clearly. Tolerances also impact 
impact costs differently depending on the manufacturing process. But keep in mind that tolerance capability is a function of material, machine condition, and feature size. So talk to your supplier or manufacturer about what tolerance ranges are realistic for your specific part. For small parts, maintaining tight tolerances is relatively easier because the effects of tool deflection, thermal expansion, and fixturing errors are minimal. In large parts, especially in casting and machining, these factors amplify and holding tight tolerances is harder and more expensive to achieve. That's why the same plus minus 0.1 millimeter tolerance on a 10 millimeter gauge is reasonable, but on a one meter long structural beam, it's much more challenging. Now I'll end by saying tolerances reflect our understanding of a product's function, how it's manufactured, assembled, and inspected. Every tolerance that you apply is a decision that affects time, cost, quality, and reliability. The goal isn't to make everything as accurate as possible, but as accurate as necessary. Learn how tolerances affect the entire product life cycle by talking to machinists, other engineers, and manufacturers. That's when tolerances will make the most sense. All right, guys, that's it for today. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, be sure to check out my video here, where I discuss why you might not truly understand mechanical engineering yet, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.